being a part of this. Please pray with me. Father God, I come before you and I do thank you for this day. I thank you for the privilege of being here, for the preparation for this, for this sermon. Father God, as I begin to preach, may your voice become so much louder and mine softer. May your words come forth. May your message be one that the church will hear and that we through your spirit will be transformed and that we will go forth to do the work that you've prepared for us. For our good, for the good of our community and our friends and our neighbors, for the good of even our enemies. But more importantly, Father, we just ask that you receive all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Practical, living life God's way. We're looking at 1 Corinthians, and, and we know that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth because they were struggling. I mean, you, you've been here. If you've listened to these sermons, you know. They had lost sight of Jesus Christ, and because of that, ungodly cultural influences, influences had infected the church, and that led to sin, disunity, chaos, confusion. The people in the church, I know you can't even begin to believe this, but people in the church were fighting with other people in the church. This person had a problem with that person, and this person thought they were a better Christian than that person, and, and, and it caused division in a church. We can't today believe that that could possibly happen. That in the church, there were people that were celebrating sin, a sin that was so horrific that even the pagans wouldn't do it. There was a guy in the church sleeping with his stepmother. And the church was like, oh, look how godly we are. We're so full of grace. That's okay. Sexual sin was rampant in the church. These people were confused about Christian liberty, how to use their freedom in Christ. They were confused about spiritual gifts and how to use them. These people were actually confused and some of them were rejecting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? And because of it, their worship, their gathering together as one body to lift up Jesus Christ to worship God, their worship was a mess. The Corinthian Christians were not living like Christ. And because of that, the believers, the church, was no longer honoring and they were no longer sharing Jesus effectively. Last week, Scott showed us that Paul was teaching about Christian liberty. And that's just, in Christ, we're free. We're free from the burden of the law. We can now eat what we want to eat, including bacon. Amen? Amen? We don't have to keep these special holy days and these special Sabbaths. We don't have to go to the temple and do sacrifices anymore. Do you know what Christian liberty means? It means that we no longer have to do things to earn salvation. What an amazing gift Jesus is. But Paul goes on and he says to these Christians, you, because of your Christian liberty, should never, ever put your rights and your freedom ahead of the needs of other people when it comes to sharing the gospel. And he shows us in his own life, Paul gladly sacrificed his rights. So he had the privilege of sharing the good news of Jesus. That meant that he would give up food if he had to. It meant that he gave up his right to receive pay for the ministry he did. He gave up relationships, including the right to have a wife. He would give up anything and everything just if he had the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus with other people. And Paul's teaching on Christian liberty was intentional. He wanted the church to understand as he was getting ready to talk about the problems in their worship. He's like, remember, Christian liberty is not that we scream for our rights. It's that we are willing to sacrifice our rights for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if the church could understand that, again, he gives the solution before he tells us the problem. And after showing us the way that we're supposed to live and, and that he's doing all of this, this is what Paul says. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now we could read that and just zip right past it. But if you stopped and sat in that moment, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. What a powerful statement. That we, the believers in Jesus, are called to live like Jesus. 
So here's the question for you all right now off the very beginning of the sermon. In light of everything that we've learned so far in 1 Corinthians, everything that we've taught about and preached about and all these things that you've learned, how are you doing imitating Christ? In the past month, it's been more than a month, we're coming up on almost two months of sermons now. At any point from the first sermon until now, have you left here and actually stopped and evaluated your life in light of gospel truth? Have you stopped and said, how am I doing living the way that Paul tells believers to live? Have any of you made any changes because of what, what God has told us about how we live our lives? It's been almost two months. Have any of you actually prayed that the Holy Spirit would reveal to you any sin that's in your life and then help you to live life God's way? Have, have any of you like actually taken the sermons on Sunday and gone home and thought about them and prayed to God to transform you? Because I'm letting you know, all of our sermons, anytime we're up here preaching, our sermons are meant to preach, to teach, and to challenge us. Each and every one of us to look at our lives in light of this gospel truth we're revealing and say, how am I supposed to live this out in my life every day? It is not just so you can be excited on Sunday. It's not just so you can be comforted or challenged or, or annoyed by me being up here on Sunday. That's not the purpose. The purpose is that you will allow God to change your life every day for your good and for his glory. Because we need to know that if we want to be the real church, who here wants to be the real church? See, you got to be more excited than that. I'm, I'm just telling you, like, it's, like no, I, I get it. It's weird. It's weird to be actually, like, interactive in a sermon. But I'm telling you, you got to think about this. Practical, living life God's way being the real church, you have to decide today, is that what you really want? Or do you just want to come on Sundays and get some church? Or do you want to be the church? Because if we want to be the real church, we have to see something. That real faith will lead to real transformation that will be seen by how we're really living our lives. Yeah, you can come. You, you can know all the things and all the words and you can read the, the Bible and you can have the bag and the t-shirts and the mugs and you can have all the stuff. But if I can't see, if the world can't see Christ in you, what does it say about your faith? And this is hard, but I'm telling you, this is what we see in Scripture, that people are changed. And so setting all that up, this gets us to chapter 11. This is that beginning part of the problems in the church. Here, here Paul is addressing that the church is struggling in their public worship, coming together as a family, coming together as one body. But the main problem that is underneath all these other problems is this. The church had allowed culture that they lived in, how the world acted and what the world believed to influence the church. Culture had entered into their lives and was more influential than the Holy Spirit that was living in them. Now, now think about that. Stop for a second. Believers in Jesus Christ had allowed culture to become more influential in their lives than the Holy Spirit that lived in them. I mean, that, that's not a problem that the church faces today, is it? Believers acting more like the world than they do Christ? People engaging in all sorts of sinful behavior, but they said, hey, I go on Sundays occasionally, I give, or I, I, I love Jesus, I just am not going to be transformed by him. I mean, that's not any issue that we have. All right, just wanted to prepare us, so let's get into the text. Today, because 11 has so much going on, talking about public worship, today I just want to, I want to focus on verses 2 through 16. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of a woman and God is the head of Christ. 
Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, well then let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord, neither is a woman independent of man, nor is the man independent of woman. For as woman originates from man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge for yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it's a glory to her? For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, argumentative, difficult, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. All right, I want to start off with this. This is a section of scripture that has been confusing and caused problems within the church for way too long. So how do we get past that? Well, we need to start off by remembering that Paul is talking to a, a specific group of people in a specific place from a specific culture about a specific problem. Now, here's our issue. We don't have the letters the Corinthians wrote to Paul. Paul doesn't spell out clearly what the actual problem is for us to say, this is it. So what do we do? We have to look in the context. We have to do the work to understand the language. We have to understand the culture so that we can figure out the problem. So like I said, we got to understand the culture so that we know how to apply this text correctly for us today. Now, I told you at the very beginning that because this sermon series could be so detailed, we could get in the weeds, that I'm not going to give you everything. I'm not going to be able to address everything verse by verse. There are things that you're going to want me to talk about today that I'm not. You can call me. You can meet me. We can figure all that stuff out later. I just want to get into the big picture cultural context. So first is this. The church in Corinth is a mixed church. There's different ethnicities, different cultures, different values, and different traditions. And the one we need to focus on today is this, that for the Roman culture, this is a Roman city in the Roman Empire. For Romans, their hair and their clothes are extremely important. You see, in the Roman world, your appearance would tell everyone, just by looking at you, they would know your identity. By how you wore your hair, the clothing that you wore, they knew your gender, your age, your social status. They even knew your profession, in a lot of cases, by your appearance. Do we kind of do some of that today too? John Organist is standing over, well, he's sitting over here, and he's in his uniform because he's on duty today. Can I look at John and realize he's a police officer? He is a Decatur County Sheriff's deputy. I can tell. If I go into a hospital, can I tell the doctors and the nurses from the patients? Yes. See, we do the same thing today, but it was more important for them. It was more pronounced. It was part of their culture in a way that we can't begin to understand. And hair, in particular, this is going to drive you guys nuts. You're going to be like, this can't be, but this is the way it is. Hair was super important to the Romans. At this time that we're talking about in the Roman world, men kept their hair very short, oftentimes combed forward. About 20 years ago, when my boys were teenagers, the style was big in America. All the boys, today they look like alpacas. They got all this hair that's all fluffy and you know what I'm talking about. But back then it was cut short, combed forward. In fact, they had a name for it. It was called the Caesar. Do y'all remember that hairstyle years ago? That's how men did it. Very, very short, very, very tight. And for a man to have longer hair than that, for a man to spend time like taking care of his hair, that was looked down on. It was considered to be effeminate. You were being womanly to have hair longer than that. 
But for women, oh, this is unbelievable that this is what they believed. Women's hair was considered erotic. It was considered sexual. It was considered like another erogenous zone. In fact, I was talking to a bunch of preachers this last week, and we got talking about this subject, and uh, one guy was showing me this scholar that said, yeah, for Romans, it was kind of like walking around with your, with your head uncovered for a woman was like walking around with genitalia exposed. Oh, wait a second. Now you're starting to kind of understand a little bit. And because it was so sexualized, their hair, it meant that women who were able to definitely spent a lot of time working on their hair. In fact, they had slaves who had their only job was preparing the hair of women. They would do this elaborate hairstyles. They would do complex braids. Women would actually color their hair. They would put different adornments in there. I mean, we can't imagine that, can we? Or could we? Because even today, don't women learn as, they, as they're growing up, like, y'all put some effort into your hair and you look good. So I'm not saying don't. I mean, I'm just saying hair's always been very, very unique in all cultures. But because of this cultural status, because of the sexual meaning of women's hair, it meant that head coverings, of course, took on a very specific and important role in the culture. A woman would not go out in public without a head covering, and they had a name for it. It was called a Paula. Now, can you imagine if everyone thought your hair was kind of sexy? You wouldn't you want to cover up too? So the head covering was a sign of a respectable woman. It was a modest woman. It, it was a woman who, who didn't want to be offensive and, and didn't want to be objectified. If you went out without a head covering, that was seen as scandalous. It was a sign of disrespect, and it would bring shame to a young girl's father or to a woman's husband for her to be running around town with her head uncovered. In fact, there are some historians that talk about how prostitutes in that day would stand outside or in the doorways with their hair uncovered, all done up to entice men to come in and pay for their services. That's the culture that we're dealing with. In fact, hair played such a large part in the sexuality and the attractiveness of women that if a woman was caught in adultery, you know what the punishment was? Y'all know, see, you know. Her head was shaved as a sign of her shame. You're not going to look good anymore. You're not going to look sexy anymore. And everyone's going to know what you did. So we know we've done the work that, that respectable women would wear, women would wear head coverings in public. And we now know why. But there's more if we want to understand what Paul's getting at. You see, we also know when we do the study that Roman men during public worship, especially the men who led worship, would wear these special head coverings when they were praying, when they were speaking, when they were offering sacrifices. But we also know this, in the Roman world, who was the person leading worship? It was a priest. And the priest and the priestesses, when they were leading worship, actually had these very specific kinds of head coverings. They were specific materials and colors, and it showed off their status. I'm the big guy. It showed everyone who was worshiping I've got the authority. It also showed everyone that I, I was submissive and I was devoted to my gods. Head coverings told people everything they needed to know. So in that cultural context, Paul begins by commending the Corinthians before he gets them, before he has to talk to them and say, hey, there's a problem. He says, hey, good job. You are following my teachings, the traditions that I've passed down to you. See, even when we're messing up, do we mess up completely? No. We understand, we all, listen, I mess up, you mess up. So if, if I come to you, I want to let you know, these are the things you're doing really, really well. But there's some things we need to work on, and that's what Paul's doing. What a great way of doing this, of, of entering into this. But then he says, listen, you're doing a great job, but here are the things that you're really struggling with in these areas. And how does Paul correct this problem? He introduces the idea of headship. 
Now, this is something we don't talk a lot about today in our culture, but in the Greek, the word is kafal. And I know I don't want to give you a lot of stuff, but I've got to give you some of this so you understand. I'm sorry. You know, we got to get into this word nerd stuff today. I've, I've avoided it for two months. But kafal is a very specific word. And it literally means the head. So all of you have a kafal. If, you, if you're here today walking around, this is your kafal. But it also means source. So a river has a headwaters, the source of the river. That's a kafal. It also means someone who has priority or who takes preeminence. It also means lordship. So it's, it's used to express someone is supreme over or has some form of authority. That's how Paul's using this here. But more importantly, he's saying you have a kafal, so what is your responsibility to that headship that's over you. If we have a head over us, then it's our responsibility to submit willingly and lovingly to that headship. And Paul says everyone has a head over them in some way or another. He said Jesus is the head over all the men. The husband is the head over the wife. And even Jesus, even Jesus, though he is equal in substance, equal in power, and equal in glory to God the Father, he himself submits to the headship of the Father over him in that role. Is submission a bad thing? No. Paul explains this idea of headship by using the cultural idea of hair and head coverings. Because those are the problems that are cause, those are the things that are causing problems in the church. But before I tell you about that, I want to say this, because I think we need to hear this. This is countercultural. This is against what the world wants us to know. But in the church, this is a reality for us. For the Christian, we need to understand and we need to accept that headship and submission are a part of God's plan and they're good. Me submitting to the elders of the church is good. Me submitting to the church, we submit to one another, is good. Me submitting to Jesus is really good. And we submit because this is one of the ways that we can actually show everyone else and show ourselves that we're living at our faith. Our submission gives glory to God. Who would like to give glory to God? You know what? We're like, oh, I'll serve. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go give food away. I'll clean. I'll, 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 I'll scrub a toilet. I'll, I'll sweep floors. I'll go visit people in the hospital. But let someone try to tell me how to live my life. Let someone who has authority over me tell me something I need to do to change. It's awful hard to glorify God when I've got to submit but that's what we're called to do. And as Christians, we all know and we all accept it's so easy. If I told you guys that Jesus is head over all of us, what would you say? Yeah. Amen. Good. Yeah. Okay. Great. But here's something we need to say that the culture doesn't want to hear. And I'll probably get some emails about this later on. In our culture, it goes against this, but God's plan is that wives will also voluntarily submit to the headship of their husbands. That's harder. That the church will vol voluntarily submit to the headship of the elders. This isn't a statement of value. This isn't about worth of a person. It's all about the roles and the responsibilities that God has created in his church. That's what it's about. And we will bring glory to God when we live into the roles that God has given to us. But it needs to be done voluntarily. It needs to be done because we love God so much, I can submit. told you Christianity is simple but man Christianity is not easy because who here loves to give their rights up to let someone else have authority over them who loves having someone get into their life and tell them this is wrong you need to stop or I need you to start doing this or hey can we talk close the door 
See, when I go into the office and Mike says, come in, let's talk. And he says, close the door. I'm like, okay, here it comes. Uh, but you know what? God has called me to this congregation. God has called me to be under the shepherding of Mike Bartlett. So out of my love for Jesus Christ and out of my love for the congregation, and out of my love for Mike, I submit. Because that's what we're called to do. And if we don't do it, if we don't live into the roles that God gave us, if we're going to be argumentative and difficult and we're not going to voluntarily submit, then guess what? We've brought shame and dishonor to God. Who wants to do that? So when looking at this text, what a lot of people miss is who does Paul talk to first? Before he ever says anything to any woman, who does he talk to? Oh, why is that always missed when talking about this chapter? Well, we ain't going to miss it today. Paul says to the men first, do not cover your head in worship. This is, we don't understand it, but I'm telling you, this is a direct teaching about headship, and it addresses the way we're supposed to worship because of the way the, the non-Christians worshiped. Remember I told you that pagan priests had special kinds of head coverings that said to everyone that was there, this is the priest said, this is the guy, this is their social status, they're up. The head covering tells everyone, the priest is the person in authority. He's the kafal. All of you, would that priest would have to say, if I want to get to the gods, I got to go through that man. He became the mediator, the priest and the priestesses were the in-between that got between you guys and their gods. Do I want to worship? I got to go to the temple and I got to go to the priest. If I want to sacrifice, I got to go to the priest and priestesses. If I want to offer, if I want to pray, if I want to do anything, I can't go straight to my gods. I've got to go to the priest. So for Christian men, those who took a lead in worship, who were praying and prophesying, who were out there publicly in active worship, if they wore a head covering for everyone that was watching, it was confusing. Because it overtly identified them as having authority that they did not have. It gave them a role that God never gave them. And if a man, if a Christian man is worshiping and covers his head in that culture, he's identifying himself with culture, not with Jesus Christ. Is that a problem? Yes. But if they didn't wear a head covering, and they're up there, that is a powerful symbol. Because they're showing that my role up here is not as the representative. I'm not the mediator between God and men. I'm not the head of the church. You know why? Because Jesus is the head of the church. So, so I, I need to be clear to you guys. I, I just want you to understand this. In all of our worship, in all of our study, any time that Mike, Scott, or myself are up here, we are not mediators between all of you and God. You don't have to come to me to go to Jesus because Jesus is the head. We're pastors. We're shepherds. We care for you. We're overseers. We're providing direction. We have these responsibilities to take care of and to correct and to discipline and to disciple and to love. We're servants. Jesus is the head. And sometimes we're going to have to speak kind of directly to you with a little bit of force, but it's not because we have the authority, it's because Jesus has it. And we're just trying to do right by him. So how would you apply all this today? Well, you know, it happens even today. You know that, right? Do you all know that there are some churches that their, their priests, their, their preachers have special vestments? They have special clothing. They'll have hats, they'll have robes, they'll have these stoles, they'll have collars, they have all sorts of different things that mark the person who's up here as being the guy. That's the person in the church that has authority. That's the person that is your go-between between you and Jesus. That person up there is more than just an average worshiper. Their clothing marks them as special. We're still struggling with this problem today. And in churches, I've noticed that even that don't have these special clothing, I know so many churches that some way they, they elevate, they lift up their pastors, their preachers on a pedestal. 
Like they have special parking spots up front. Like they get honored and like you get to say Reverend so-and-so or Mr. so-and-so or their wives are the first lady of the church or something. I mean, like, I'm just telling you, and again, I'm not trying to slam them. I'm just saying in light of scripture, when we're trying to set people apart as though they're better than, we're messing up. So some of you have come here and you struggle with the fact that it's just Mike, it's just Scott, it's, it's just George. We're not different. We're not better. We're just worshipers like you given a specific role. So all Paul is trying to say to the men is this, know your role. Know that Jesus is the head, not you. Don't, don't get too uppity here and think that there's something special about you. In the Christian church, we do not elevate people leading to being more exalted than anyone else. You see, in Christ, we're all equal. We're all the same. But we all have different roles and different responsibilities. Paul also told the men, don't have long hair. Caused so much confusion in the church. What's long hair? For the Romans, it was that cut. It was very short. And because of the powerful meaning that they had with hair, any man that had hair longer than that would have been a problem. Paul is saying, listen, you love Jesus. You want to respect and honor the head that is over you. You need to show people that Jesus is your Lord. And one way you do that is follow clear roles that God gave you, including gender roles. Again, men and women are equal in value. We're both co-heirs in salvation. But praise Jesus Christ, men and women are not the same. So in that culture, long hair for men, you're girly. You're feminine. You're weak. You're blurring gender roles. But again, because their hair was so short, this is not about a specific length. It's more about style. You see, to a Roman citizen, a Jewish man's hair, especially a man who took the Nazarite vow, which you do not cut your hair, their hair would have seemed absurdly long. But Paul's saying hair is just the sign of the real issue. Paul wants to make sure that the church was not being co-opted and confused by their culture. He doesn't want the church to ever send mixed messages, confused messages about who God is. So what would this look like in the church today? There's a couple of ways. Today, if a Christian man is not getting their family up and leading them into church, if a Christian man is not discipling their wives and their children into a relationship with Jesus, if a Christian man is not stepping up and leading and serving in the church and in their family, if a Christian man is not living sacrificially, they have long hair. They're bringing shame to Jesus because they're not living into the roles that God gave them. But a more obvious example would be this. If a Christian man, and I'm talking about Christians, if a Christian man decided that he was going to begin cross-dressing, I'm not talking about a guy wearing a kilt. That is still a man wearing a man's dress, a man's clothing. I'm talking about someone who's trying to present. I am a man. I have been born as a man, but I'm presenting as a woman. I'm living my life as a woman. That too would be causing confusion about God's roles and bringing shame to the head. Does that make sense? What Paul's getting at? How about women? What's up with that? Well, it seems like in the Corinthian church, you have some women who have taken their freedom in Christ, their, their Christian liberty, and they're now using it to act in ways that are bringing shame or disrespect onto their, their husbands, onto the church, and onto God. So given the context that we have, what we're looking at most likely is that there are women who are participating in worship without a head covering. Well, why? It might be because they're considering that their worship is private, not public. You see, they didn't go to the temples to worship. Where did they worship? In homes. It would be a large room, a gathering room, kind of maybe a little smaller than this. And you'd have these tables that would line around the, the, the edges on three sides. And you would go there and you would eat and you would, you would worship and you would sing and you would prophesy and you would pray and you would do all the things that you do at worship. But you're doing it in a home. And these women may have gotten confused and said, 
this is private so I can let my hair down literally. Or it could have been that there are women who said, well, because I'm free in Christ and I no longer have to follow the law, that means I also don't have to follow social rules too. Or maybe, just maybe you had some women in the church that were a little contentious, that were a little bit argumentative, or women who like to push the boundaries. They have their freedom, so how far can I push this? Could have been all of those. But the reason doesn't matter. What matters is they were attending worship with uncovered hair. Maybe they had ornate, provocative hairstyles. Maybe they were being seen by the people in the church and the people out of the church as overtly sexual. That, please understand, how, how like scandalous and divisive that would have been in a church that's already struggling with disunity. Now, Paul had already reminded the church, remember last week, Christian liberty, that just because you could do something doesn't mean that you should do something. So what he's trying to get at here is that if you're doing something that's bringing shame to your husbands, if you're doing something that is bringing disrespect into the church, you're also dishonoring God. And in that case, it is better for us to give up our Christian liberty and submit and wear the head coverings so that we are honoring God. And in fact, he says, listen, if you all don't understand what I'm trying to say, then ladies who are argumentative about this, I'm just telling you, go ahead and shave your heads. Because if that's too embarrassing for you, if that's too shameful for you to shave your head, then you should understand that you need to cover your head to not bring shame to God too. It is clear. It is right there. So, so how would we think about it today? Again, there's a couple of, of ways now, again, I'm trying to be careful here, but I, I need you to hear this. I need you to understand what was going on back then so we know what the problem really is. It would be like today if a believing woman, if a Christian woman, was to walk into worship this morning wearing a completely tight see-through dress with nothing else on underneath. It would be like a Christian woman, a believing woman, walking in here in a micro bikini that barely covers anything. I know that's kind of graphic and I'm sorry, but we need to understand how shocking this behavior would be. If that happened today in the church, do you think that would cause some confusion among people here? Do you think that would potentially cause any problems or issues that the leadership needs to address? Yeah. We as the leaders would want all believers to cover up all the appropriate parts. Modesty, respect. We're not saying how you need to dress. We're just saying, like, you don't have to wear this. Like, we wouldn't say, okay, to, to be modest, we need all of you women to wear a head covering. We need you to wear long sleeves, a turtleneck, long pants, boots, and gloves so we don't see any skin. I mean, we wouldn't go that far. That's going way beyond what we need to. But we would say, could you be appropriately dressed? And the reason this text has been confusing is because people want to focus on head coverings and not understand how the Corinthian church would have heard this message. So they miss the principles that Paul is teaching. The issue is not about hair and head covering. Those are just the outward signs. Paul is teaching about honoring and giving glory to God. God is talking about living with modesty and respect. God, Paul is talking about how the fact is that how we live our lives actually affects the message that we're trying to share to the world about Jesus. Again, that's not popular today. I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. No, living practically is living life God's way. So Paul wants the Corinthian women to submit to the headship over them by living into the role that God has actually given them. And to show that Jesus is the head, they've got to understand and be aware of how you're perceived in the culture. So how do we apply that today? I know this is going to be unpopular. A lot of people are going to push back on this. Probably not you guys, but there's others who will. I would say that definitely there are issues with how believing women are supposed to dress in public today. Now, it's in the culture, 
Don't dress in a way that would be overtly sexual. Don't dress in a way that would be disrespectful or scandalous. Because if you're bringing disrespect to your family, to the church, or to God, that's a problem. So believers need to be aware of how we're presenting. But I want to say this, don't forget that sanctification, this idea of us growing in grace in Christ, it's a process. And that means that not every believer is going to be convicted at the exact same time. It's not believed that every believer, it means not every believer is going to be convicted in the exact same way. So please hear me. Do not anoint yourselves as being the fashion police. And if someone walks in here, you're going to run over to them and say, you shouldn't be wearing that. That's not your role. Your role is, how am I dressing? The elders are responsible for the bigger church. We also, we need to remember that the issue is about respect and honoring the head, not us having a universal dress code that women have to wear um, skirts and long sleeve shirts all the time, or women have to wear hats every time they're out in public. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying, let's be respectful and honoring to the head. There's another application, just like with the men, there's another application. And it would be this, that a woman who refuses to honor her husband, a woman who is constantly argumentative, a woman who is combative, a woman who tries to control the direction of the family or the church, I think those kinds of problems of not honoring the head, Paul would say to those women, if you're going to act that way, just go ahead and shave your head. If you're going to bring that kind of disrespect and dishonor and shame to God, just go all the way. Now, we're not saying shave heads. Uh, that's metaphorically, not literally. But understand, just like men, when women refuse to actually live into the roles and the responsibility that God has given to you, it brings shame and dishonor to God. Now, now I'm, I'm praying that today has given us just a little bit of clarity and understanding about what this text actually says. But more importantly, I have prayed all week long and I'm going to continue to pray that we have all been challenged to actually look at our lives when we leave here today and ask ourselves, am I truly living my life as though Jesus is my head? Do I live my life as though Jesus truly has authority and is greater than me? And I just want to say, we don't submit because we have to. This isn't being taught because, because we have to do this to prove we're saved. We don't have to do this to prove to anyone that, that, that I have to do something to earn my salvation. Please, 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 if you hear nothing else, hear this. Jesus paid for all of our sins on the cross. And his sacrifice... His beautiful sacrifice is more than enough to pay for all of my sins. I can't add anything to his work. No, we submit to this kind of life, to thinking more of others than we do ourselves, to giving up our rights to be unified, to, to, to living in a certain way that we can have the privilege of sharing Jesus with the world. We do this because we know that we can glorify God by living in this role. We also do it because we know, we know that God wants the best for us, that God loves us more than anyone could possibly love us, and he wants good for us. So I can trust him and say, God, I may not understand all of this, why I have to submit, but I know that it's good, and I know that you're glorified, so I can trust you. But hear this too. I'm praying we all go and we think about this life. But if you want to do this, you will not be able to live this kind of life until you have first submitted completely to the headship of Jesus Christ. And I'm talking to believers. You have to be all in with Jesus. You have to say, I'm going to give up my rights. I'm going to give up what I think is best for me to live the way God wants me to, even if it's going to be hard. Why? because we want to glorify God. Let's pray. Father God, I come before you and I do thank you so much for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for understanding. 
that it's about roles and responsibilities, that it's about honoring you, glorifying you, living into the life that you've called us to. Father God, this life is not always easy. It doesn't always make a lot of sense in, 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 a, in an earthly way. So Father God, give us spiritual ears, give us a heart to, to truly understand, and then may your spirit help us to live this out today and every day. And if there is any confusion, Father God, I, I ask that the church would come and talk. Talk to me, talk to the elders. Let's get clarity on this. So there's no confusion, there's no hurt feelings, there's just love for you and for one another so that we can spread the gospel. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.